Well, it looks like, from what I can tell, we have about two more messages in 2 Timothy. You say, right. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. Two more messages in 2 Timothy. After I finish, we will return to the Gospel of Matthew, with the possible exception of a one-day or one-week delay. We'll see. I'm still praying about that. I want to thank all of you for your prayers this week. Uh, the pastors really appreciate your petitions to God for us on our behalf. The numerous burdens that we carry uh, that we can't really share in full details are numerous. But just know this, we thank you for your prayers and we have many, many in our congregation that are some very hurting people. And uh, it's one thing to stand up here and preach the word. It's a whole other thing to be able to teach and encourage and instruct from the word to those that are hurting. And I would say that this is something you need to pray for also. Pray for us that we will be an encourager and encourage people with the word. Again, the depth of this pain is unimaginable, and it is our responsibility as pastors to carry their burden to a degree and to encourage them with the word. So, again, thank you for your prayers. As Paul faces his impending martyrdom, he tells Timothy what must be his priorities in ministry. The last command in our section here in verse 5 is the summary of it. We talked about it last week. Look, at verse 5, but you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, and here it is, fulfill your ministry. That's kind of the summary of this whole section of what is required by Timothy, the pastor, as he shepherds the people, the church in Ephesus. Last week we learned this passage unfolds into five sections that describe this fulfilling your ministry. And he starts in verse 1 with the motivation for ministry. The motivation for ministry in verse 1. Paul reminded Timothy of the great importance of his calling in light of who God is and where God is and what God is doing now and in the future. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. We are to serve in ministry as pastors and shepherds, knowing that we're serving in the presence of God, and that these responsibilities are seen by God, are being observed by God, and one day we will give an account for our ministry before God. We know that the Lord is also coming one day, and we want to be ready, and we want you to be ready, by us preaching the word, because he is the judge of the living and the dead. And we have to take this responsibility to preach the word very seriously. So we serve, pastors that is, biblical pastors, serve with holy reverence and a love for God and a love for people. And we aren't, we aren't, uh, and when we aren't doing this, what's in order? Repentance, we too have to continually look to the Lord. Whenever we're, we get distracted or whenever we get sidetracked from doing this for God's glory and God's honor and for your good and to preach the word accurately or we get distracted by the word, we're called to repentance. Just like y'all are called to repentance every week. We are all the time. So again, I would ask for you to continue to pray for us that we will be quick to repentance if we get distracted or sidetracked. We must be turning to God continually through faith in Jesus. So we have the motivation for ministry. Next we saw in verse 2 the primary mission of ministry. The primary mission of ministry. This is what the shepherd does. It is our mission. It, this, pri this is our primary function. It's important to note that preaching the word is not just in the pulpit. It also includes when we teach when we counsel, when we confront false teachers, when you call and ask us a question at 11 o'clock at night, we are supposed to teach the word. When it's convenient, 
and when it's inconvenient. We're supposed to be ready all the time. Did you know that a pastor's job is 24-7? That is our job. That is our role. That is our mission. We're supposed to be ready all the time to preach the word. All the time. So does that mean that you should call me on Monday? No, if you can avoid it, it'd be great. Call one of the other elders on Monday. (laughs) But if there's an emergency, we're there. Because we know that that's our calling. The Apostle Paul didn't say, hey, nope, not right now. Why is that? I need some family time. And for my children, they know this sacrifice, don't you guys? You know that at times dad is called on regularly. Uh, And you're not a sermon illustration. Oh, I guess you are. But in a sense, I think they're learning, aren't they? Y'all are learning that serving Jesus means sacrificing for others. And that's what we're all about, right? Even though we live right on the property, people can come in at any time and we want to preach the word, teach the word. Because that's what we're about. That's what we're supposed to be. Do we do it perfect? Oh, no. Still our work in progress. In our time here is the concept in in our, our day and time in evangelical circles, though. There's this concept. Have you ever heard the term missional? Missional. You need to be missional. Is this what Paul's talking about here? I don't believe so. I don't think he's talking about being missional here. I know you've heard this, and some of you might say, well, I heard this preacher talk a, do a great sermon on being missional. Well, I think there might be some aspects of missional might be okay, but let's, let's dig in a little bit on this mission and what is the mission of the pastor. Missional during our day is just another phrase for, in many cases, culturally relevant. Culturally relevant. In other words, doing ministry with a, a, a large focus on the felt needs of the culture of our people. But beloved, I want you to hear me and hear me clearly. Being multi, missional can very easily become just another way of being ear, an ear-tickling preacher. <laughs> Do you hear me? Being missional can be that. Listen, I'm not up here to tell you about how you can enjoy your cultural things and differences. That's not what this is about. Yes, we are different, but what is the main mission of the pastor? <laughs> preach the Word. That's what we do. We preach the Word. We proclaim a kingdom to come. A kingdom to come. Not here. We proclaim the glories of Jesus. We proclaim salvation through faith in Jesus alone. It's a very narrow message, isn't it? It's the word of God. We're all about repentance and faith. and We're not all about here and now. I know we have to be very careful in arguing from silence from the Bible. But I would challenge you. I would challenge you to read the epistles and answer this question. How many times does Paul call the churches or leaders to be culturally relevant? I don't think anywhere. I don't think he once says that. How many times does he address the governmental systems or the cultural traditions? I'll give you a short answer. Zero. I don't see it anywhere. Remember, Nero, Nero's got him in prison. He's about to die. Deathbed, don't you think? Okay, well, get it out there. Nero's a ruthless, wicked, sinful man. None of that in here. None of it. I'm supposed to preach the word. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to. I would argue the only thing he addresses is how the believer should avoid sin. The sins of the culture, maybe. He doesn't do that. Don't be like the Corinthians. 
In fact, he says, don't allow culture or ethnic differences to affect church fellowship at all. So the mission of the pastor and all of the elders is to preach and teach the word, not be culturally relevant. I know that might not sit well, but it's what the Bible appears to be saying. So how is the preacher supposed to proclaim the word? Well, we see it in the, in the verse. Verse 2, it says, reprove, rebuke, exhort, or encourage one another with the word of God. That's what we do. And this is a high calling, isn't it? What an amazing blessing. What an amazing thought that I get to preach God's word <laughs> And we take it serious. We are here to proclaim the word, to be ready to proclaim the word always. And we are to reprove with the word, we are to rebuke with the word, and we are to encourage and comfort with the word. On top of all of this, we are to do this with a right attitude. Always. We're supposed to do it with great or all patience and instruction. Friends, pastors are to preach with forbearance and patience and always teaching the truth. Have you ever, when you're reading through the Bible, have you ever come to the places where you kind of read through and you, you realize the depth of what God's calling, to you and call, calling you to and you just say, oh no, how do I do this? How do I always teach, always proclaim, always live, always do this with great patience and instruction? The answer is we get, we remember Jesus. We look to the gospel, the truth that we're proclaiming. Remember who Christ is and what he did for us. And it humbles us. And we're reminded that we can't be angry at anybody because ultimately if we get angry or impatient with anybody, we're actually lumping sin on the Savior who died for us. Can't even imagine that. Don't want to do that. It's not easy. But by the grace of God, we can do this. This goes for you as parents as you teach the word in your home. You've got to be patient too. That's what shepherding is. You do it with patience and kindness. So please pray for your shepherds. Again, I call you, pray for us and pray for yourselves. As we fulfill the mission to be heralds of the king, to you all with great patience and instruction. In fact, we must proclaim the truth even if professing believers don't want the truth. (laughs) This brings us to the next point. Look at it in verse 3. The caution for ministry. The caution for ministry. In verse 3 it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Can you imagine, just for a second, just think about this for a second. Can you imagine, this is probably being, was probably read to the church in Ephesus as Timothy was reading it. Who was he talking about? Them. (laughs) He was saying, you know what, (laughs) church? (laughs) This church you're preaching to and teaching to and shepherding, many of them, they're going to fall away. They're going to look for ear-tickling preachers. They're not going to want you. Wow, can you imagine being told that? What should it do? Should drive them to repentance, right? Should drive them to their knees. Paul is speaking to the church in Ephesus, that church that Paul had spent so many time, had so much time with. He knew the church was going to face a downward trajectory or trend. 
So was Paul prophesying here? Or was this just a case of knowing the normal trajectory of churches and ministries? I think it's the second. I don't think he's prophesying here. What do I mean by that? Y'all understand that the normal trajectory, the normal trend for a church is down. Ultimately, by the end, it, 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 ministries go down. It's a downward spiral. Uh, look, uh, for example, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, out of the seven churches, five of them had major problems. Five out of seven. And Paul had told these same elders in Ephesus that false teachers were going to arise up amongst them to lead away The sheep. Friends, listen to me closely. The enemy's attention is on the church. His focus is on the church. Satan hates the church just as he hated their Lord. He knows the sheep who are weak in the church. He knows the sheep that are really not sheep, but lost professing sheep. He knows all of that. And the devil uses weak and lost professing believers to hurt the church. So sadly, it's it's predictable that as time goes along, churches can have a downward trajectory. It can peak out and then start going down. This puts a little fear in me. How about you? A good fear. By the way, if you look at church history, do you see this pattern? Oh, yeah, you see this pattern. We saw this in the overall church as it slid into Roman Catholicism and went into false teaching, right? The Dark Ages, almost a thousand years before the Reformation happened where much of the church was lost in works righteousness. Then we've seen it in mainline denominations, like the Methodists, the Wesleyans, the Lutherans, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, the Congregationalists, the Episcopalians, the Anglicans. Do you understand that a lot of these mainline denominations have completely rejected the Word of God now? Many of them hate God's Word. How is it that many of these have now begun to embrace the homosexual agenda and you have homosexual preachers marrying that? What is that? That's a rejection of what? God and His Word. They've abandoned the Word of God. Sought ear-tickling pastors. We've also seen this in seminaries. In Europe, (laughs) it's hard to find anybody that even believes the gospel now. In Europe, in all the seminaries there, very few. Here in America, did you know know that Harvard, Princeton, Yale, did you know that they were started and they taught pastors... How to preach the word. And now these are as liberal as you possibly can imagine. And they're secular completely. You have denied God completely. I don't think it was a stretch for the Apostle Paul to say, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. It's the pattern. You know the good news? As the church begins to die, God plants new churches and does new works all over the world. Because ultimately, God is building this church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. But we need to take this seriously. And we need to thank the Lord for those that come along that 
bring about the Reformation. Those men that stand up truth, stand for the truth, and they preach the word again. (laughs) Or in the 19th century, Charles Spurgeon and men like Martin Lloyd-Jones. Or how about in the last hundred years, R.C. Sproul and Al Mohler and John MacArthur. John MacArthur's, what, 50th year anniversary this week. That's pretty cool. Yes, I'm acknowledging John MacArthur here. It's okay. The guy preached the Bible in one church for 50 years. That's pretty amazing. Way to go, God, right? It's not about John. It's about what God's done. I pray that I'm able to preach the word for 50 years and be faithful. Will you pray for us? But sadly, it's the overall pattern of the church to slide away from the truth. Why? Why do churches slide away from the truth? Ultimately, the church members want the wrong thing. Look, the passage says it. Look. Look, the passage says it. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Here it is. Here's the reason for the slide. Professing believers, professing believers want something that is in accordance with their desires. Want something in accordance with their desires. Ultimately, they don't want Jesus. Instead, they have fleshly cravings that are the Lord of their hearts. Grace Bible, a church, our church, will survive only as long as the revelation of God in the Bible remains our primary desire. And it's got to be what we seek. Every one of you must want God's word. You've got to want that more than anything else. You've got to want him and his revelation and his word more than anything else. So which comes first? False teachers who teach wrong doctrine that leads to falling away sheep? Or weak sheep who seek teachers who encourage their failings. In this passage, it points to what? Weak sheep wanting pastors that encourage their failings. You said, well, as much as you gave yourself a hard time last week, you sure are stepping on our toes today. <laughs> Again, I don't, I don't see myself as any better, beloved. It's real easy for me to want the easy message too. But there's hope in who? In Jesus. He's our hope. Here Paul says the order is the sheep seeking teachers to promote their wrong desires. No, I admit it. I admit that sometimes coming to a church like ours can be a little painful. (laughs) And And maybe we can even get, I'm going to say it, get a little boring. Maybe maybe it's not super exciting all the time. Maybe there's not as many bells and whistles. And maybe the pastor doesn't isn't a lunatic every Sunday. And doesn't bring out plastic boats and get them and do nice illustrations for you to see. But beloved, what you need to seek is the word of God. Whether it's preached with me screaming at the top of my lungs or just plain monotone. Because the word of God is the important thing. It's not about being entertained. Right? We just want the word. Here Paul emphasizes that it's the sheep's responsibility, and if they don't, then Timothy should do what? 
preach the word anyway. So it's important for all of us to ask ourselves continuously this question. Ready? Here's the question. What do I want from church and the shepherds that lead me? What do I want? What's my primary desire? You should be asking that question. What is my primary desire? You should also ask, do you want men who preach the word that reprove, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching? Or do you want someone who tells you what you want to hear all the time, what is easy to hear, and what doesn't require putting sin to death? Now, I'm not going to be that guy. You know, you've seen him. Online, I think there's this one, I, I'm not going to show you the clip, it was unbelievable, where the guy walks down and says, what are you doing here? You haven't been here last Sunday. Just kidding. I'm not going to do that. It's not about that, is it? That's just the shock effect and hit the pastor trying to say, look at me, Right? Somehow he's holy. He tells him, hey, be quiet over there. Listen to me. I have something important to say. What? There was a big group that went down that road. Many in the fundamentalist movement went down that road. But we are going to exhort you. We are going to rebuke you. We are going to call you to repent. Again, why? Because your sanctification matters. We know that walking with Jesus is where true joy is found. It's not because we think we're better. I actually had somebody kind of rebuke me this week. And I thank the person for rebuking me. It was good. Because it made me sit back and look at it and think about it a little bit. It was good. Made me look to the Lord. Ask the question. Don't worry, it wasn't something that disqualified me. But it was good. Do you mind being rebuked by the word? Is it always easy to hear? No. But we want it, don't we? We all need it. We need to be exhorted and encouraged to turn to the glory of God in Scripture. We need this. Not a feel-good message. Because true joy, like we've said is found in Christ Jesus. For the record, what points to the demise of church of a church is choosing teachers who promote fleshly desires over repentant faith. This is also an indicator of professing Christians that are on the downward track. If you're picking your teacher on based on or your preacher based on whether he tickles my ear, then you should be afraid. However, our pastors here at Grace Bible, we must preach the word. In season and out of season, whether y'all are liking it or not liking it, we have to preach the word. Paul is saying to Timothy, even the solid church in Ephesus will eventually fall for heretical and pragmatic preaching. Pragmatism is a key indicator of a church's decline. We don't teach what brings the largest crowd. We don't, preach the war. we don't preach something that will get a big crowd. As I've said before, if I wanted to fill this place up, I could do it. I really could. You know, I got people to sell a $1,000 vacuum cleaner part-time and had 100 of them yelling at the top of their lungs, screaming, I want to sell a rainbow vacuum cleaner. 
Now, if I can do that, I'm fairly sure by my enthusiasm, I can fill this room up. None of y'all, just by raise of hands, how many of you want to go out and sell vacuum cleaners? There are, there's one. <laughs> you got to sell the rainbow. It's really good. <laughs> you say, well, but again, pragmatism is not what we're about here. We're not. We're about preaching the word. We don't teach what brings the largest crowd always. Matter of fact, Jesus said what? He said, the stone which the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. To the Gentiles, foolishness. This is why popular culture must not determine what our message is. We can't and will not preach a message that appeals to fleshly desires. By God's grace, we will never water down the truth because we fear what others think of us. To do so is to encourage people to delight in less than the best, which is Jesus. So, Paul exhorts Timothy, preach even when your crowd, your audience says, no, I want ear ticklers. Next, Paul gives a summation. Notice in verse 5, a summation of ministry. He says, but you, be sober in all things. Endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Man, if you don't like commands, this one starts getting rough because he just throws out another bunch of commands. <laughs> Here they are, do this. Ouch. Again, by the grace of God, right? By the grace of God, we can do this. By the grace of God alone. Paul gives four more commands. He says, be sober in all things. This means to be well-balanced and self-controlled. Ministry is often all about keeping your head, being under, under control, staying level-headed. And this must be true always of shepherds. We can't be thrown about by the emotional responses of the world. We can't be those that are reactionaries. We can't, oh no, oh no, oh no, got to preach on this. Oh no, no, oh no, 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 I got to preach on this. Got to be careful of that, right? You see this in the media, don't you? <laughs> you see this, man, something happens and everybody blows up. And then two or three days, two, two or three days later, you find out it wasn't true or it, they're on to the next story. Isn't it interesting that what leads our country is social media and media? Those are the things that lead us. The emotional responses and reactions instead of being sober in all things. You need shepherds that are not going to be blown to and fro by the every wind of doctrine and everything that comes along in this world. Again overwhelmed by my need of the Lord. Please pray for us. Please pray for us. And also the shepherd should endure hardship, being patient and bearing with it. This means we must be spiritual. Uh, we must be spiritually strong, not spiritual wimps running whenever there's pain. We must abide under all of what God sovereignly gives us, no matter what it is. We, we get the phone call that says, I just had a new baby. And we got to go, yes, that's good. Praise the Lord. Let me pray for you. And the next phone call is, is my father just died. We have to endure that. I just found out I have cancer and have Whatever. We have to endure those things. We have to bear up under those things. And at times it can be overwhelming, as I've said. Please pray for your pastors. We also must be, we must do the work of an evangelist. It is to be an evangelist. It, or is it to be an evangelist or is it to do the work of an evangelist? 
Is he talking to Timothy and saying, do this work of evangelism, or is it be an evangelist? Well, I think he's calling him to do the work of it. That is, do that work of looking outside to lost people, too, sharing the gospel. It's very important for us to understand, and I want you to all get this. And, 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 and sadly, you know who has to learn this most? I've already alluded to it a little bit in our message, is my children, my children and my family. You know what they have to learn as a pastor's child in a pastor's home? You know what they have to learn? They have to learn to share their daddy. They have to learn that their life is not all about me and them. They have to learn that it's really all about what? Other people and serving them. They have to learn that. A church be, should be shepherded by shepherds that are looking outside also, not just inward. If you have a pastor that all he does is focuses on your needs, it might be that he's off track just a little bit. We should all be looking outside too, not just inward, right? Right? And that goes all the way down to the most minute of details. In the home. If your home is all about you, and everything's about you, you're really set up for a fall. You should be looking outside, making disciples, being engaged in the church. That's how we as shepherds are supposed to think. We can't just think about you. we got to think about others too. <laughs> The Lord is so good. There's visitors here today. Some of you are visitors. I'm so thankful you're here. I'm really thankful. Aren't y'all thankful? And we got some good news. Let me tell you about the good news real quick. You ready? Here's the good news. We all are all born sinners. You say, how's that good news? That ain't good news. Yes, it is good news. I'm getting there. Hang in there. We all have sinned. We were born sinners. We were born in rebellion against God. But God, he sent his son into the world. And his son came into the world to die to pay for sin. This sinner. And he died and paid for sin and then was placed in a grave. And he rose from the dead on the third day bodily. And he's alive. And he did all that. So that anybody who would repent and believe in him, they could have new life. They could have all their sins paid for. They could be right with God. And they could walk with him. So if you're new and you're visiting here, have you repented? Have you turned from your sins and trusted in Jesus Christ alone? Is he your Lord and Savior? Do you know all your sins are forgiven? doing the work of an evangelist. I want you to meet the living God and have relationship with him. For it's there that we have rest and peace and forgiveness of sin. And our home is in heaven and eternity is glorious. Trust in Christ. This is the shepherd's responsibility To look in, hand out, to shepherd the sheep, and call for repentance. Fulfill your ministry. That's what we're supposed to do. So who do we look to? We look to Jesus Christ, our Lord, who gives us the grace to accomplish these things. And, and though we're not perfect, and though we're, we fail and mess up and fall on our face and look back up to the Lord, we have a good God that uses crooked sticks to draw straight lines to the Savior. Next, Paul gives a perfect illustration of a shepherd who sought to live this way all the way to the end of his life. Guess who that illustration is? You might have thought, Jesus, right? Well, no, it was Paul himself. Paul, looking to Jesus, ultimately, 
Look at the illustration of ministry found in verses 6 to 8. Verse 4, or verse 6 rather. For I, Paul, am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This is beautiful. This is Paul talking. Now, I don't know about you guys. The tendency is, is when I'm in my sin or I'm struggling, I read something like this and I think to myself, well, Paul sure does seem to be bragging on himself a little bit, doesn't he? I mean, look at him. I'm already being poured out. I've I fought the fight. I'm, I finished the course. Man, he looks pretty proud. Is he proud? No. See, if anybody in the planet knew that it was only by the grace of God that was accomplishing all this, Paul knew it. He's ultimately bragging on what God's done through him. But God does do great things through his people. He did it presently. You see that first. And then he's done it in the past for Paul. And you see his past record of God working in him. And then you see the future. Look at it. His present reality is, is for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. What is that? His present reality is, is that he's going to die. And ultimately, he's already dying, being poured out as a drink offering. It's pointing to the idea of the Old Testament sacrifices. Are all the sacrifices of the Old Testament done away with? Everybody in the room? Good. I'm glad you got that right. I'm glad you got that right. All right, they're all gone. But did you know that there are sacrifices happening daily? Yes, there are. Guess who they are? Everybody that's a believer in Jesus, raise your hand. You are being poured out daily. Romans 12. A living sacrifice. That's what we are. All who have believed in Jesus now are what? We're about dying to self now. It's not about us anymore. It's about serving others. It's about loving others. It's about pointing others to Christ. It's about glorifying Christ Jesus. It's not about us anymore, is it? It really is. There's really only two ways to live. For yourself or for God and others. Those are the two paths. If you're a true born-again believer, you're living for God and others. If you're not yet saved, you're living for yourself. You say, well, I don't do that very well. What's the call? Repent. Turn to Christ. He's your hope. Look glorious at his beautiful face. And as you think on Christ, there's nothing else that we want to do, right? Right? As I proclaim the gospel, believers, all of y'all in the room, when I proclaim the gospel there, were you not in your hearts going, yeah, Jesus is good. <laughs> this is good. How many of you were like, yeah, he's given the gospel? Any of you? He's given the gospel. Boy, this is good news, isn't it? Jesus Christ came to the world to die for sinners like us. Yes, let's announce it. And it makes you do what? Stop thinking about me. And start worshiping him. And start sacrificing for others. And that's where Paul is. And even if he dies, it's okay. <laughs> because to live is Christ and to die is gain. But he looks back on his past and he says, I fought the good fight. Implies what? It's war. It has been war. Anybody else in the war? I'm in the war. It's rough, isn't it? Any of you battle sin this week? Yeah, I was, I was making war with it with you. How about you? 
Was the enemy after you? Was the world trying to entice you? Absolutely. We fought the good fight last week and the week before and the week before that, right? And he says, I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. He's continued to trust in the Lord throughout the whole time, ever since his conversion. And what happens here is really interesting. His faith, he just begins to express his faith in his look to the future. He says, instead of saying, I believe the future is going to be great, he just, sa- he just expresses it. Look at it. He says, in the future, in the future, it's his heart, it's just screaming. In the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Oh, the crown of righteousness. Does this mean that there's a future justification of sinners? The answer to that is an emphatic no. No. Justification happens when we're converted. We're declared right with God. But what is this? This is the state of righteousness that's coming in glory. When we shed these bodies of death and everybody in the room says, Amen, come on. (laughs) Right? We want that. I'm looking forward to the day when I shed this body of death. When I don't sin anymore and I enjoy God perfectly and I have the crown of righteousness. I can't wait. How about you? And it's what I'm looking for. It is my hope. We know the righteous judge will give it to those who Trust in Him. And He will award it to us on that day. You know, I don't know about you, but the more I think about this, the more I think, you know, if there was, there's two things I want in heaven. Two things, really, just two things. One, I can't wait to be with Jesus. I cannot wait to be with God, just unfettered, just all Him. I can't wait. How about you? It's going to be great. Second thing I can't wait for is that I can be with him and not have a sinful inclination in my body. Oh, please, I can't wait. That is going to be a glorious day. (laughs) It'll drive you to do and serve him no matter what. That's where he's at. This is where Paul is. He's just like, wow, I can't wait till that glorious day. You want to hear the good news? Here's some good news. And it's not only for the Apostle Paul, but also to all who loved his appearing. I think this appearing is talking about the appearing to come. And let me tell you why. Because I think in verse 1 he talked about it by his appearing and his kingdom in verse 1. I think the appearing, now he, uh, Jesus appeared twice, right? He appeared what? At his first coming and then his second coming when he returns his appearing. But ultimately all of us love both appearings, right? We love the first coming when he came and died to pay for our sins, and we can't wait, and we love the fact that Jesus will return one day. And this is what we look to. This is who we look to. This is who we trust in. So this is a call for all of us. To put the Word of God as the priority in our life with our eyes fixed on the future glory to come. If you're here today and you don't know that saving gospel, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please come talk to us. Come talk to me afterwards. Grab my hand say, I'm still not sure I need help. Please help me. I want to tell you some good news. Come to me. I'll tell you about Jesus. But if you're here today and you're struggling and you're at war and you're fighting... And it's becoming weary, wearying, and you want to give up. Anybody in here, you get there occasionally, you I just, I don't know if I can handle it. Put your
put your attention back on Jesus. Your hope is not in your present circumstances. Your hope is in the future glory. And even if your time of departure has come today or this week or next month, our glory is to come. When we will receive that crown of righteousness from our King and Lord who died in our place. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness, your goodness, your grace, your that you poured out on the Apostle Paul and then you poured out in each of us who believe. Father, we know that we are not perfect. We know that we are definitely a work in progress. We know that we are a part of the vine and we are those branches that need pruning. Oh God, do whatever it takes to get us to bear fruit. Fruit that will glorify you. May we proclaim, may we teach, may we abide, may we enjoy the Word of God. May we enjoy the revelation of God in the Word of God that says that Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you, Father, for Christ. Thank you for His death on our behalf. Thank you for His resurrection life that we have in Him. Help us now, Lord, to go and serve you as our King. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.